Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie O'Dell, Clinical Director for Medical Optometry America. I'm excited to be joining you today, and today I'm going to be introducing a brand new medication to the market called Isuvis. So this is Lodopredinol um, 0.25%, and it's our first prescription therapy specifically for the short-term treatment of dry eye disease. Again, the indication for Isuvis, it is a corticosteroid indicated for the short-term, up to two weeks treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. When compared to other corticosteroids, um, the main you know, contraindications will stay the same, those being most viral diseases of the cornea and conjunctiva related to things like herpes simplex, um, herpes um, varicella virus. Um, also, if there's a mycobacterial infection of the eye or fungal disease of the ocular structures, we want to make sure that we aren't prescribing this medication for those patients. Other warnings and precautions we're used to seeing when we're talking about um, corticosteroids, and that would be delayed healing and, um, and possible risk to the corneal, corneal health with corneal perforation, um, intraocular pressure, cataracts, bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections. Um, with Isuvis in, in specific, it, the most common adverse drug reaction was reported um, in about 5%, and that was installation site pain. So again, not something that we aren't seeing when we're treating patients, especially with dry eye, that installation site pain. But I think that you'll be excited to see this science um, and the studies that got this medication FDA approved, and I think it will help build your confidence for prescribing in the future. So today I am speaking on, the, on behalf of Cala Pharmaceuticals. Although this is a non-CE or CME program, it is still presented on behalf of Cala Pharmaceuticals and is intended for the US eye, professional, eye care professionals only. The information contained within the presentation is intended for general information purposes, and it's not as a substitute for your professional medical advice or judgment. So let's just get dig right into what we know, you know, what we hear a lot about dry eye disease, and that is that it is a big problem for the patients that we serve. Nearly 38 million Americans have symptoms consistent with dry eye disease. That is a big number. Of that number, 17.2 million are diagnosed. So again, a very big disconnect between the number of people living with the disease and the number of people that are diagnosed with the disease. Some of the common risk factors notoriously have been things like female gender, postmenopausal um, females, especially because of changes in their estrogen levels. Um, but what you'll really be surprised to see, and you can see this on the right-hand side of this um, slide, is that Although, you know, we've often thought of age as another risk factor, you'll see that we're actually seeing the amount of dry eye increasing in our younger age group. So if you look at the population 18 to 49 years, for example, we've seen a 3.4% increase in the number of people with dry eye disease when you look at data from 2005 to 2012. Um, and if you look at even younger than that, you'll see that there's even, you know, a, a half of a point five percent or a half percent increase in our younger population. So I think a lot of things, you know, still do remain in that group above 50, you know, with still big growths within that subpopulation, 11% um, still, you know, increase over these um, over these years, but it, it's, it's interesting to see that that age number is coming down. And so you don't want to use age as a, as a risk factor. Um, and we'll talk to why that might be as we move along. So remember, dry eye is a chronic inflammatory disease, which is why something like Isuvis fits so beautifully because it is a medication that is helping target inflammation. So if you think about just the etiology and the pathophysiology um, and even the symptoms of, of dry eye, inflammation is the root cause of all of this. So we know that inflammation begins, that then helps to create an unstable tear film. We start to lose that homeostasis that we're working hard to restore for these patients. We see things like um, ocular surface stress, and then we start to see the breakdown of the tissues, ocular surface damage. Some of the signs and symptoms of dry eye that can really also be related to this inflammatory, you know, process would be, you know, the big hallmark of inflammation, right? 
redness. So not surprising to see conjunctival hyperemia top of this list. Again, if you think about inflammation and how that plays a role over time for a, a, a person, ocular surface staining, again, another thing that we're really trained to look for, whether it's fluorescein or lysamine green staining, but that's a, a telltale sign of inflammation and dry eye disease. And then if you think about from the patient's standpoint, they are experiencing like things, symptoms like discomfort, and that might feel any number of things. They might report dryness. They might report pain. They report oftentimes blurry vision and eye fatigue. Um, and then we can't forget about fluctuating vision because fluctuating vision oftentimes to our patients isn't ringing, you know, isn't alarming them to something like dry eye disease. And that's the one that kind of, you know, raises the red flag when a patient is presenting and they have a complaint of fluctuating vision. I'd like to know a little bit more about what that means is, do they start their day out comfortably with good vision? They start doing, you know, maybe a job that's computer-based, um, and now after you know hours of using the digital device, now they're starting to notice that they have some blurred vision along with other symptoms of burning or burning or that eye fatigue. You know, that's important. Does their vision fluctuate when they blink? Oftentimes I'm finding that when I'm doing my vision check, you know, whether it's you know refraction or um, mostly when I'm doing refraction or when my tech's checking the vision, they'll tip off, you know, tip me off to, hey, that patient had to blink a few times to clear. So those are really important things. Again, people often don't realize that blinking to clear the vision isn't abnormal. We as the eye care providers do, and that's where our education really helps um, for the patients to understand, okay, this fluctuation in my vision that improves when I blink my eye isn't normal, and how can I do something about it? One thing that we maybe haven't thought as much of is how dry eye disease although is a, you know, is a chronic disease, has flares. And so that is what really is important to learn and understand is that episodic flare is a common feature of chronic inflammatory diseases, such as dry eye disease. When trying to communicate this with our patients and even trying to retrain yourself on how you're thinking about your dry eye patients, it's easy to look to systemic diseases and other ocular diseases to kind of make those analogies. So take, for instance, uveitis. If we just start with, you know, an eye disease that we're used to treating, comfortable treating, we know that in uveitis patients, they will have a flare. We don't know maybe all the reasons why they will have a flare, but we know what to do if that happens. And oftentimes that looks like, you know, giving a medication that a patient could have on hand, starting a medication, calling your office to say, okay, my symptoms have worsened, and then getting them in to, to be seen in that case. Another disease that you would see this would be something like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. For those patients, if they have a flare, maybe because of an activity that they've done, they might notice, you know, more stiffness in a joint or inactivity um, or immobility rather of, of a joint and have to turn to a medication to help them through a flare. Same is true with our lupus patients. Exacerbations is a big part of lupus. And then one, although not an autoimmune disease, um, is asthma. And this one I think really is a, a good way to introduce the idea of flares to patients because if they aren't themselves living with asthma, chances are good that they've known someone in their lifetime that does you know, have asthma and is treated for asthma. If you think about the way that asthma is treated, there's often chronic medications that are used for inhalers, and then there'll be something like a rescue inhaler that a patient needs when they might be in an environment where allergies might be causing worsening of their, you know, symptoms or maybe even physical activity. So that one, I think, really translates well both to the provider, us, and also when you're having the conversation with your dry eye patients about what does episodic flare mean. Remember, dry eye is a chronic immune disease and, again, has periods of this dysregulation of that homeostatic imbalance, and that then leads to the ocular surface stress. So TFOS Dues 2 did a wonderful job of giving us, you know, new language and definition around dry eye with their um, workshop in 2017, and homeostasis is a big part of that definition. If we look to our treatment goals, restoring homeostasis is a big part of that as well. With the eye tissue and the and dry eye, the reason why we know that it is this 
chronic immune disease is because it has its own lymphoid tissues. Um, it has its own microbiome. Um, it has its own cytokines and, you know, immune system that is helping to fight off the, the things that are attacking the ocular surface every day. If you think about it, it's actually amazing that we can keep that surface moist day in and day out when it's open, you know, for, you know, probably half of the waking hours of a person. Again, inflammation is a key role um, underlying all types of dry eye disease, whether you're dealing in an aqueous deficient or our evaporative dry eye patients. And then this is something that, you know, I think is really important. And maybe sometimes when you're thinking about dry eye disease or prescribing a medication, you might not really be thinking, you know, this deep into what exactly am I doing to this local immune system that the eye has. Um, but but it is important to know what you are doing because we are, uh, we are targeting two different systems depending on the treatments that we have for patients. So when you're dealing with this acute flare, you're actually dealing with both the patient's innate response, innate immune response, as well as the adaptive immune response. Now, remember that that innate immune response is something that is triggered within hours of exposure. And then over hours to days, it kind of turns into the adaptive response. And that's where the chronicity of the disease kind of lingers is that you have this adaptive immune response that's going for days to months, you know, and even longer. In, until you can really grasp hold of the underlying cause of what's triggering this over um, um, response of the immune system, and that is controlling the inflammation. If dry eye is characterized by these acute exacerbations of signs and symptoms, or what now is being called dry eye flares, let's talk about what are the characteristics of dry eye flares. So these are periods of time when there is a rapid onset of, of inflammation. It is caused by um, a variety of triggers, and we'll talk more to them. It usually cannot be adequately, adequately managed with what the patient is on as far as a chronic medication. So oftentimes these patients present and they are on some kind of chronic dry eye medication um, for their disease, but yet the flare comes and their foundational medications just isn't enough. Um, it can also happen for patients multiple times a year. So on average, we're seeing about four to six times that patients are reporting these flares. And it can have big impacts on work productivity. I feel like, you know, the research continues to grow. And this is a great slide that talks us through some of that. But I, you know, I feel like we as the doctors sometimes maybe don't have this conversation. And I, I think sometimes still the employer might not understand the severity um, of what dry eye can do to a patient over, you know, the course of their disease. And so this, this study is, um, uh, you know, some, some relatively new research that looks at what's called presenteeism, which is you are physically at work, but you might not be performing your best. And also talks a little bit to something called absenteeism, which is when you are not showing up to work because whatever the ailment is, is preventing you to do so. So the first one was a study that Kelly Nichols did that looked at 158 patients and what she found in this survey was that dry eye disease caused a 30% impairment of presenteeism or that workplace performance or work productivity or, you know, maybe non-job related activities. So a 30% impairment, if you think about that for someone's work day, that's a lot of time that they could be performing better. Um, so it's something that you definitely want to talk to your patients about. Another survey looks at a, a larger population of 589 patients, and of this group, dry eye disease led to two to three times more difficulty with everyday activities. This group, things like reading, working, computer use, even things like leisure, watching television, um, and, and things that we sometimes might take for granted, which is driving ability, right? So sometimes because of symptoms, maybe photophobia, um, or glare patients who actually have ocular surface disease struggle with daytime or nighttime driving and something that we need to be thinking of in our dry eye patients just as much as we think about it in our patients that have cataracts developing, for example. Dry eye disease can also um, negatively impact cataract and refractive surgery. And I think that the research on this area is certainly growing. Optometry is playing such a crucial role in this 
specific area. Um, our surgeons want an optimized ocular surface at the time that they are seeing the patient for the first time, because the measurements that they are taking on that first visit, whether it be cataract you know, surgery, whether it be premium IOL, whether it be a refractive surgery, LASIK or PRK, the measurements can be, you know, can be different if the ocular surface and that loss of homeostasis is unbalanced. And we want to be giving our surgeons an optimized ocular surface so that they can, you know, get right to doing the surgeries that we referred for. If you look at some of the studies that are coming out around surgical cases and dry eye as a risk, um, this one study, a retrospective study, looking at um, a, case, a case study series um, of about 565 eyes with regression after LASIK. Um, regression after LASIK occurred in 27% of patients with dry eye versus only 7% of patients who did not have dry eye. So that's, a, you know, first of all, big investment, a big time, you know, to, you know, life-changing event for patients. If you want to, in, you know, you want to help optimize the ocular surface so that you can um, help provide stability of the outcome. And I think that any patient would appreciate knowing that. Another one is with our cataract patients. If you look at this study with 43 eyes, dry eye disease caused blurred vision in about 15% of cataract surgical patients. And that one's always kind of confusing, right? Your patients, you know, they've had friends and family that have gone through cataract surgery. They're seeing perfect next day. And when they're not, it's a really big cause for concern. And a lot of times um, that blurred vision, you know, can be related to an unstable uh, tear film and, and unstable homeostasis balance. And, and really just working again ahead of surgery to optimize the ocular surface is going to help with outcomes. And I know that our ophthalmology colleagues would applaud us for taking the time to do pre-surgical evaluations for ocular surface disease for their patients. Let's take a look at kind of the path of a patient with chronic dry eye disease. So, you know, what I love about this slide is that dry eye disease is a journey. You know, it is a journey that our patients are taking. And like a lot of journeys and just the journey of life, there's a lot of bumps along the road. So in this drawing, you know, the, the meandering road is kind of the journey of your dry eye patient. The orange or red um, are kind of like the speed bumps, like what your dry eye patient might encounter that is going to cause a, a, an episodic flare. Some of these things um, are seasonal allergies. Some of these things are increased, you know, air conditioning. So it's seasonal, right? So sometimes in the summertime, you might see it when the air conditioners turn on. Sometimes in the wintertime, you're going to see it when the heat kicks on. The digital screen that we talked to a little bit earlier, big, big concern. And remember, that has a lot to do with you know, not only the light being emitted from those um, devices, but from the way that we perform when we're staring at these devices um, or underperform. So our blink is getting cut in half. Um, and when I have that conversation with the patient that, that often, you know, okay, that makes sense. So my eye now is open twice as long as it's supposed to be um, if I was doing another task. And, and because of that, it's not prepared to keep itself regulated and keep itself moist and provide you with your best vision. And that's why a lot of times you'll see that blurred vision happen with hours of digital device use. When you're able to travel, using you know airplanes and, and such is a super dry um, environment, that low humidity um, you know, I often wonder how people that work in airlines, you know, do, do their job because even for me flying, you know, four hours is sort of my max before I need to be putting something in my eyes or I, I feel it for sure the next day. Let's not forget our patients who were fitting in contact lenses, a big part of contact lenses. As soon as they put the lens into their eye, they're splitting the tear film, you know, and in essence, you know, causing that disruption to the tear film. And then like I touched on earlier, whenever we're recommending surgical procedures, yeah, you know, and it doesn't just fall with cataract and refractive surgery, but any surgical procedure. I often think of, you know, my AMD patient that's going and having injections every six weeks. I think about, um, you know, a glaucoma patient that's undergoing surgery, you have to, you know, even your oculoplastic surgeries, you have to think of as well.
So let's talk about how do you define, so these are kind of the bumps in the road, and I'm sure that you all have other ones, you know, other, another one that kind of comes to my mind or, you know, just what we're using from chemicals between, you know, putting cosmetics on our face and taking cosmetics off our face, you know, that's another big one for me. Um, but let's talk about just what the definition is of, um, of a flare. So a dry eye flare is an episodic increase of symptoms and signs that is a rapid that happens in a rapid onset um, and it's inflammation driven. So it's an inflammation driven response, again, to a variety of triggers that typically cannot be adequately managed with what the patient's ongoing maintenance therapy is, whether that's a chronic therapy or their artificial tears that they're using daily. 80% of patients with dry eyes suffer from flares and almost half report having primary flares um, as a, as part of their condition rather than continuous symptoms. So that's kind of interesting to me for sure. So if you look at a patient who's suffering from dry eye flares alone instead of continuous symptoms on the right-hand side of this slide, um, that is happening as high as 45% of our dry eye patients, that they're just having the flares. So this, what, what concerns me about this is if I don't educate my patient about you know, they're at risk for dry eye disease, for example, just because of lifestyle that they have, or maybe age of the patient, or, or you know, if I'm not going with age, you know, just probably lifestyle of the patient, um, then I might not know that they are having the flares, right? But if I educate them to, okay, so you're spending a lot of time on a digital device use, or your job is requiring you to be traveling a lot, and you're in an environment that is creating this low humidity, it's not optimal for your eyes. Um, if you notice X, Y, or Z, you should let me know, because it could be the warning sign of a chronic eye disease, dry eye disease. But if I don't know that these 45% of patients are having a flare and they're not telling me, you know, that's a, you know, could be a big disconnect. So I think a, a big opportunity for us just to continue the education um, for our patients. If you look at um, patients that are suffering flares with um, continuous symptoms or, you know, chronicity of the, the disease, we're seeing numbers as high as 79% reporting, yes, I do have a flare, even though I'm treated for dry eye with a, with a medication. So these studies, you know, these large studies have assessed the nature of dry eye flares, um, and they've given us this information. And I think it's really important to just, you know, carry on that conversation with your patient um, when you're talking to them about the disease, or if you know, again, that they have lifestyle risks, um, even if they maybe are not symptomatic at the time of your visit, just to have that conversation with them, hey, you know, again, hey, if you notice these things, please bring them to our attention as we see you. And that's because of this. Patients might not be discussing dry eye flares with us, the eye care providers. One study showed that 80% of patients with dry eye are suffering from flares, but may not be sharing this information during our visits. And that was kind of where I was going with my concern for that big, you know, that big disconnect um, or 45% of patients only having flares, not continuous symptoms. You know, if my tooth aches, but then it gets better um, and I didn't go to the dentist for another six months, I might forget that my tooth was aching, you know, six months ago and it might not, I might not think to ask that kind of thing. There was a survey done of 201 eye care providers that was both ophthalmology and optometry, and they felt that only 40% of their patients had dry eye flares. So remember, of the dry eye patients with continuous symptoms, we saw that number as high as 79%. So, you know, there is a disconnect, but I think that, you know, the purpose of things like today is really to help educate you to what a dry eye flare is, how common they are, and then eventually what you can do for your patients. But I think that you can see from this, it's important that we're asking our patients if they are experiencing these flares um, or dry eye flares in between our visits. This gives us another really big area of unmet needs in treating our dry eye patients is targeting these patients that we know have dry eye flares, upwards of 79% of them. So if you think about a patient who's using um, artificial tears, Artificial tears, we know, they aren't targeting um, the underlying cause of dry eye, which is inflammation. So because of that, we're going to see spikes in that innate and adaptive immune response because inflammation is not being treated. They oftentimes are taken, you know, multiple times a day. I've had patients really overusing artificial tears, especially when they're 
preserved, you know, um, 10 times a day, they, they, you know, sometimes more, you know, why? Because something about their management wasn't yet being addressed. And again, you know, that's partly because these are only giving this temporary or palliative re response. So in our patients that are using artificial tears, 81% of that group say that they still suffer flares. That one's not as big of a surprise to me because again, if I'm not targeting inflammation, I would expect you to have more of an unbalance of your tear film in certain environments. If you look at patients who are using a prescription dry eye product, right? Um, so patients using approved dry eye products, 91% um, of these patients still suffered flares. Now this one I think is a little bit more shocking because if I have a patient on a therapy, you know, that's a lot of breakthrough um, or exacerbations of their disease, 91%, that, that number's pretty, pretty high. If you look at what we have as far as treatment landscape, yes, we've we've gone come a long way since the introduction of our first medication for dry eye disease um, or keratoconjunctivitis sicca, but there are no FDA approved medications designed for short-term relief or these short-term flares. Our medications that we maybe have been using to target inflammation all require time, right? So we know that these medications can take weeks to months to really help our symptomatic patients. We know that, you know, we see that as one of the big challenges when we're prescribing our chronic medications is timeline to symptom relief. We know that they have to be taken chronically and that creates a whole other problem for patients. You know, we see a lot of adherence problems with chronic medications. Most of our um, chronic medications are BID dosing daily for the rest of a patient's life. And that can be hard to adhere to. And we see it, you know, with, with other medications that are um, needed to um, prevent blindness when we're treating our glaucoma patients. And there's, you know, studies with adherence to glaucoma medications are quite high. So now think of something, you know, not vision threatening and, um, you know, it's not surprising that we see the same challenges um, with adherence being an issue. So again, when we're thinking about the therapy that we would want for a patient with a dry eye flare, because a, dr a dry eye flare is coming on rapidly for the patient, we want something that's going to provide rapid relief for the patient. So one of the things I would say that we would all pick as far as you know, a medication that would be helping a patient in a flare setting would be something with a rapid onset of action, something that quickly relieves the signs and symptoms of whatever the, you know, whatever that sign and symptom is. We want to also align with what our patient's desires are, you know, as much as we can. So short term is appealing um, and that is, you know, good for patient compliance. We want to target the reason why they're having the flare in the first place, which we touched on multiple times, which is inflammation. So having something that could be anti-inflammatory in nature, again, targeting that underlying cause of dry eye disease is imperative. And we, you know, for me, I, I really like prescribing medications that are FDA approved. I like to say that to patients, you know, it often helps the conversation, you know, this is FDA approved for you. And, and actually I feel like with, um, with this particular medication um, and this particular conversation, I think that patients are going to be actually quite excited to hear, oh, someone actually has come up with a medication that is FDA approved for the short term, you know, treatment of dry eye disease. I think that that's going to be well, very well received by our patients. And then I also want something that's well tolerated, you know. We know that with dry eye, the ocular surface and the homeostasis is out of balance and that can create some of that installation site pain. But as much as we can find medications and solutions that are well tolerated by our patients, you know, that's going to help again with the compliance um, of things. Let's take a look at the dry eye treatment landscape. Remember there's a big disconnect that um, there's a lot more people living in our country that have dry eye that are, than are diagnosed, but of the diagnosed, the 17.2 million diagnosed with dry eye disease, what's shocking is that only 10% have been treated or are under the care of an eye care professional. So that is a very low percent of patients that have the known disease that are on a medication to treat the disease. 75% of dry eye patients have never tried a dry eye therapy. 
that's kind of mind blowing to me. Um, you know, I'm in a, in a referral type setting and I oftentimes have patients call in as a new patient referred by another doctor um, or themselves. And that's always my first question is, have you been on a medication? And, you know, no, a lot of times is the answer. So, you know, 75%, though, that's a, that's a big number. So three out of every four patients have never been given the opportunity to be on a, a prescription therapy for their disease. Again, only 10% of dry eye patients are curr currently on a chronic therapy. And of the ones on therapy, only 2.9% have received a prescription for steroids. So, you know, just kind of let that all sink in and see, you know, how does that fit in with how you're treating patients? And, you know, would you argue that that would be the same or different? You know, just kind of give that some thought. But of our patients who are on the chronic medicine, 80% discontinue by four months. You know, and why would that be? You know, sometimes it could be the slower onset of symptom relief. You know, for our patients, that's what they're here for. They want to feel better. For us as the eye care providers, we want them, again, to have an optimized ocular surface, which as we do that, does improve their symptoms. Um, but, you know, they, they want it fast. I think that's kind of what it's telling us is that they're not willing to wait four months for symptom relief. 45% again of our dry eye patients are having just the flare and not the continuum of symptoms. So there's a big opportunity for, you know, what we're going to talk about now, which is Isuvis. So Isuvis is the first and only FDA approved corticosteroid indicated for the short term, up to two weeks treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. So this is exciting to me for many reasons. Again, having that FDA approval is just, you know, amazing, you know, and the work that goes into getting an FDA approval, you know, we all know how, how challenging that can be. So, you know, congratulations to Kala for getting this FDA approval and, you know, here's what we're going to learn about so that we can um, help our patients because now we see that the majority of our patients, uh, large numbers of them are suffering from flares. Again, Contraindications would be the same as what you're familiar with, with your other ophthalmic corticosteroids with viral diseases of the ocular surface, mycobacterial infections, fungal diseases of the ocular um, structures, things that you want to be mindful of. The warnings and precautions are the same um, that we see with other corticosteroids. Again, the delayed healing and risk for corneal perforation, the risk for intraocular uh, pressure increases, the risk for cataract, um, infections, bacterial, viral, fungal. Um, and then again, in Isuvis in particular, the, the biggest um, adverse event reported at about 5% of patients was the installation site pain. Isuvis is powered by something called Amplified Technology. This is a proprietary drug delivery platform. You can see it here on the right of the slide. So Amplify is utilizing something known as mucus penetrating particles. And that means that this mucus penetrating surface coating is on the molecule to prevent adherence to mucus. The other thing that's important about Amplify technology is that it has selectively sized nanoparticles. And we all know that nanoparticles are small and we need that for penetration through the mucus pores. If you look at the, on this slide, if you look to the left, this is uh, illustration of this mucus barrier for topical ophthalmic drug delivery. And it is really one of the biggest challenges that is faced you know, by companies when they're developing something for the ocular surface. Because our eye is open predominantly, you know, all waking hours for, for ourselves, our body has done a great job of, of making a, a protection shield, if you will, um, to the environment. So that's made up of, of mucus. And so penetrating through the mucus is very important if you want the medication to um, be able to be absorbed into the tissues of the ocular surface. And so doing that, you need kind of two things. You need a small molecule in a nanoparticle, and then you need something that's not going to let that molecule stick to the mucus. And that's really the beauty of the Amplify technology. It's been able to pair those two characteristics into this platform to allow for um, great penetration into the ocular tissues. 
if you look at some of the science, you know, for the FDA approval and, and rather, you know, some of the preclinical work, the graph on the right shows the ability of this MPP to increase penetration into the ocular surface. So in this preclinical trial with rabbits, um, about 48 rabbits, they received either the lodopredinol with MPP or the lodopredinol um, without. And notice that the group that had the lodopredinol with MPP actually is a lower concentration, a 0.4% versus the suspension, which is 0.5%. And what was found was that there was a more than a threefold higher ocular exposure um, of, to the cornea, to the cornea with this um, lodopredinol with MPP. So what that translates into um, is that there was a, um, a higher concentration into the tissues with a lower concentration of molecule. So, you know, that really is, is what we're looking for is the lowest concentration of a molecule you can get and maintaining great um, penetration and, and concentration. And this actually even, you know, was achieving um, higher penetration into those tissues in a lower dose, uh, or lower concentration rather than dose. So again, that Amplify platform allows for enhanced ocular surface tissue distribution and enhanced penetration to the sites of ocular surface inflammation or, you know, ocular surface tissues. The main ones that you would think of would be the cornea and conjunctiva. So ISUV is also uniquely designed for dry eye. It gets where it needs to be, which is important. Like we talked about, we have, you know, that... Um, we want it to be on the ocular targets of inflammation of the cornea and conjunctiva. And the Amplify platform helps ISUVIS to do just that, to enhance the ocular surface tis tissue distribution and penetration to those sites where inflammation is such a big player for our dry eye patients. And it's formulated in such a way that it has this low concentration. So ISUVIS actually low concentration of 0.25%. Um, and that's designed to undergo rapid metabolism. And that in turn helps to give us a good safety profile by decreasing the effect that we can sometimes see with the corticosteroid um, on the IOP. So these are uh, achieved in preclinical trials, a maximum concentration over a hundred fold greater in the cornea versus aqueous humor. So that's, you know, just going to show that the medication is not absorbing into the deeper structures of the eye, the aqueous humor, but it is where we want it to be targeting with the cornea. So I think that that is a big thing to think about when you're thinking about safety for um, the prescription use of ISUVIS. So again, ISUVIS FDA approved as a corticosteroid indicated for the short-term treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Short-term is up to two weeks of therapy. The way that it's dosed and administered, this medication, we, um, it is recommended that you shake it for two to three seconds before using, and then instill one to two drops into each eye, QID, four times daily. Again, thinking about how challenging it can be to get medications approved by the FDA, I wanted to really spend some time on the safety and efficacy um, because it, this is a big undertaking. And, you know, I think something that uh, Cala should really be proud of. It's the largest um, clinical development program in dry eye to date with uh, an N of 2,871 patients. So it's, you know, by no means a small trial. So when we look at this, you know, the clinical des trial design and the key endpoints, what you want to look at is patients were receiving either ISUVIS or vehicle four times a day for at least two weeks. In, and this took place in four multi-center, randomized, double-masked, placebo-controlled trials. It included one phase two trial and three phase three trials, stride one, stride two, and stride three. For the primary endpoint, um, when we look to signs, what was used was conjunctival hyperemia and a change in that score from baseline to day 15. When you look at symptoms, what was used for that was, was called um, the ocular discomfort severity score. And this was an analog score where zero, it actually was a line of, of 100 millimeters, and the patient had to draw out 
um, from zero to 100 millimeters where they were um, as far as the severity of their symptoms. And again, it was looking at that change in symptoms that was going to be considered statistically significant from baseline to day 15. Let's take a look at some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for these trials. For inclusion, an ongoing definition of dry eye defined by corneal fluorescein staining using the NEI scale, bulbar conjunctival hyperemia, unesthetized Schirmer test, and the OS ODS score reported by subjects again on that zero to 100 millimeter um, analog scale. Exclusion criteria included any known hypersensitivity or contraindication to the study product, a history of glaucoma, current glaucoma, or an IOP greater than 21, women who were pregnant or nursing, a history of corneal refractive surgery or corneal transplantation, and the use of topical or oral corticosteroids other than topical dry eye disease medications or topical nasovasoconstrictors within 60 days before enrollment. ISUVIS demonstrated significant improvement in ocular discomfort on day eight in strides one through three and st statistical significance on day 15 um, in strides one and three. And if you take a look at these graphs, what you're looking at is actually a change or reduction in symptoms. So the blue bars are ISUVIS and the green bars are the vehicle. So in all, in stride one, two, and three, you'll see that the blue bar, ISUVIS, has a very positive impact on the reduction of symptoms at you know, day eight and day 15 throughout all of these studies. Let's look a little deeper into that rapid onset of relief for ocular discomfort. If you look at this graph on the right-hand side, ISUVIS is the blue line and the vehicle is the gray dotted line. Looking at three pre-specified endpoints, day four, day eight, and day 15, you can see this um, separation between ISUVIS causing um, a, a reduction in ocular symptoms over vehicle. And if you look at the beginning of this graph, you can actually start to appreciate that separation beginning around day two. So when you're dealing with a patient in a dry eye flare, rapid onset of inflammation and worsening symptoms, if you can provide something that's going to give rapid onset of relief, you know, that's going to be very powerful for your patients. ISUVIS significantly reduced conjunctival hyperemia. This, remember, conjunctival hyperemia, redness, the hallmark sign of inflammation. And so for a clinical endpoint, ISUVIS was able to show this um, significant reduction of conjunctival hyperemia in all studies, um, the phase two trial, as well as stride one, stride two, and stride three. And this data is all the 15-day data. But if you think about that, you know, 15 days, a little bit more than two weeks in the, in the care of a patient, if you think about, you know, the presentation of your patient with a chronic, you know, condition um, with a flare um, and, you know, redness and, and conjunctival hyperemia is, has a lot of negative impacts on the patient. Um, they get a lot of comments from the family, they get a comments from their employers. And if you could again provide something that's going to help improve conjunctival hyperemia for your patients, it's going to, you know, really do well for you and, and, and more importantly, do well for the patients um, with their outcomes. ISUVIS is well tolerated. Let's take a look at the pooled safety findings. If you take a look at this slide, if you, if you take a look on the left-hand side, it's going to be looking at the adverse events reported during the trials. The ISUVIS group are the blue bars and the vehicle group are the green bars. So it, the, the most reported adverse event in both groups was installation site pain, although this was still a very small percent of patients, 5% in our ISUVIS group, 4.4% in our, um, about 4.4% in our um, vehicle group. Other side effects were eye pruritus, eye irritation, and blurred vision. Interestingly, when you look at the eye irritation and blurred vision, the vehicle group had more adverse events reported than our ISUVIS group. When looking to the um, illustration on the right-hand side of this slide, it's, this is going to look at concerns about elevations in IOP. An increase in IOP from baseline was defined by um, greater than or equal to 10 millimeters of mercury increase from the baseline and an IOP that was 
greater than or equal to 21 millimeters of mercury or more. And if you take a look at the two groups, first of all, one thing I'd want to point out is the, the number of patients in both these groups. In our ISUVIS group, there was about you know, 1,430 patients. And in our vehicle group, there's 1,438 patients. So this is a large number of, of patients in both groups. But what's really nice to see is this low incidence for these elevations in IOPs. With our ISUVIS group, only three patients of this 1430 um, group. So 0.2% of patients had that elevation in IOP. So I think that that, you know, safety profile is very good to see. And it makes me feel, you know, very confident when I'm thinking about prescribing this medication. Isuvis provides short-term treatment strategies for dry eye disease. Isuvis may be an appropriate first-line prescription choice for patients with dry eye who suffer episodically from dry eye flares. Remember back to the beginning of this presentation when we talked about patients who were, you know, not on any therapy that were having flares, um, not having any continuous symptoms, when we were thinking about our patients on artificial tears, artificial tears that were having a lot of breakthrough symptoms, and also our patients that are on chronic therapies having a high volume of, of breakthrough symptoms with flares. Isuvis may also be appropriate for induction therapy for patients being placed on these long-term maintenance therapies, patients on long-term therapies who experience, who experience breakthrough dry eye flares. And remember from an earlier slide, that number was as high as 91% of patients reporting that. And, and patients undergoing ocular surgery who suffer from dry eye. These are all great places to consider where ISUVIS can fit in your practice and your patient's needs. So Eric is a 56 year old male graphic web designer. So you know where this one's going. So he's spending a lot of time on computers. With his workday, he's got about 12 hour workdays, all computer based. He also has a few other things that maybe um, don't work with him when he's trying to spend that much time on a computer. One being that he's a contact lens wearer um, and he's, starting to have some concerns about his comfort in his contact lenses. And he's actually starting to think about LASIK or refractive lens exchange as a way to, to get out of his contact lens use. During this exam, he reports that his eyes are gritty and uncomfortable, and he's really blaming that on the contact lenses and his long days on the computer. He doesn't feel that there's a need to take a chronic medication because his symptoms aren't continuous in nature. He does mention that he has fluctuations in his vision, and at times he has painful red eyes, especially after long hours at work um, and sometimes during the winter season. Eric has tried many over-the-counter artificial tears and red rele redness relief drops, and he feels, you know, really kind of just stranded, like there's nothing else that can be done, which is probably part of the reason why he's even considering his refractive surgery um, options as well. When we take a look at this, you know, there's many layers to Eric. Um, I think that it's a great case to, to consider for a few things. One, you know, if we think about that journey that we were showing you earlier through this presentation, that windy road, um, he has several bumps in his road. One is contact lens use, right? So he's using contact lenses and he's you know, 56 year old. So I'm going to make the assumption that he could be in a multifocal type lens, even if he's not, in order to get the best optics of a contact lens, we need an optimal tear film. So if he's having any um, imbalance in his homeostasis and any imbalance to his tear film, we're going to see that impact the visual um, ac acuity and the visual focusing of his contact lenses, if you will. The other thing about him is another bump in his road is that he is spending a lot of time because of his job on screen. So over 12 hours, you know, so most of his waking hours are spent on some type of device. The other thing I see here is also that he does have some fluctuation to his symptoms, not only his vision, which we talked about a little bit with, you know, maybe just the contact lenses drying out and causing some disruption there, but also seasonality. He's reporting that, you know what, hey, my eyes do feel worse, definitely in the winter. Then he's also getting some clinical findings that that he's self-medicating for, which is the conjunctival hyperemia. So he's a, one of the patients that is, you know, misusing 
the redness reducer drops, um, misusing only because it, what I mean by that is he's hiding the reason why he has the redness in the first place. And so, you know, that's a big question for patients. I think if, if the eye looks white, you know, could it be because they're using a redness relief eye drop? And so asking that question when you're doing your intake form, not only are they using any medications or artificial tears, but even are they using any of these over-the-counter redness reducing eye drops? I think that's a big thing to, to ask as well. But really he's kind of at his wit's end. He makes the perfect patient for some kind of short-term medication that's going to target both signs and symptoms. So for me, this is, you know, a really easy patient to prescribe Isuvis for, um, for a number of reasons. I, I hope that by reducing inflammation, we can get his eyes looking better, which is something he's obviously wants. And as an, you know, as a executive or, you know, working with people and maybe doing these, you know, Zoom calls, you, you want to look your best too. So helping with that conjunctival hyperemia can really help him. Also painful, you know, pain. We want to help with symptoms in his case. Um, and then in turn, by controlling inflammation, if I could succeed by, you know, keeping him in his contact lens is great. And if he wants to consider his refractive surgery options, then and only then would I be comfortable having him passed on to an ophthalmology, you know, colleague to consider that. But again, you want to make sure you're targeting the ocular surface and optimizing that before we're considering surgery. But kudos to Eric for bringing this up, you know, at his appointment, because there he doesn't have to be stranded on the desert island. Um, just letting us know is half the battle. And once we know all the challenges he's meeting, we now have lots of tools in our toolbox, Isuvius, uh, Isuvius being one of them, that can really help us to maintain his um, disease and symptoms. And then lastly, we have uh, Janae. She's a 27-year-old female graduate student. She's virtually based, so she's on web-based videos for about five hours a day. But when she's not doing that, she is on social media and she um, is also even a gamer. So this is um, a big population of people um, that are spending a lot of time on digital devices for social interaction and also for leisure. So we see a lot of this with our video game, um, video gaming patients. She's reporting that her eyes are tired, red, watery a few times throughout the year. And sometimes she even has headaches and blurry vision. She's taking a redness relief eye drop to get rid of some of the redness, in addition to some over-the-counter tears every couple of hours to help with dryness. She's got a very busy life, and so she doesn't want a burden. She doesn't want the burden of an everyday RX. And really, you know, Janae thinks that she's also too young to be on any chronic medication. So in this particular case, you know, a couple of things stand out to me that younger age. So this 27-year-old uh, female grad student, you know, she's not in that over 50 group that we talked to earlier. Um, and she is in that younger group. But we can see again how lifestyle plays a big role for her with her job, her social, and her leisure all involving digital devices. Again, it comes back to um, one of the hallmark causes or one of the hallmark signs rather of inflammation being conjunctival hyperemia, redness to our patients. And a lot of our patients are self-medicating with some over-the-counter red eye reliever. Um, and so it's important again to have that conversation. But really then when you have that conversation addressing why, you know, your eyes are red for a reason, the reason is inflammation, we have ways to target inflammation. And now, you know, with Isuvis, there is an FDA approved treatment for the short-term relief of your symptoms and your signs of dry eye disease. You know, so I think that she fits kind of really well into that, um, the Isuvis candidate bucket, if you will. So just to summarize, Isuvis is the first and only FDA approved corticosteroid indicated for the short-term treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Isuvis has a unique formulation. Remember, Isuvis is powered by Amplify for that enhancement of ocular surface tissue um, distribution and penetration. Isuvis ser serves an unmet need in dry eye disease. Dry eye flares are something that is a big unmet need for our patients. So remember, most patients with dry eye experience dry eye flares. 
And oftentimes they are not consistent, continuous symptoms. They're independent of that chronicity of the disease. Another thing that's really important to remember about um, ISUVIS is that it shows significant improvement. So again, in the largest clinical development program to date, ISUVIS was shown to significantly improve both symptoms and signs of dry eye. And lastly, but not least, ISUVIS is well tolerated. So treatment with ISUVIS is well tolerated. Again, remember that the incidence of adverse events was very low. Um, the, the biggest one um, at 5% was the installation site pain. And if you're thinking about the safety when it comes to, you know, the risk for increased IOP, we saw that in 0.2% of patients. So you can feel very confident um, in this medication's safety profile. Well, I want to thank you for your time and encourage you to reach for Isuvis, the first and only FDA-approved corticosteroid indicated for the short-term, up to two weeks, treatment of the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Let's take a few minutes to look at the questions that have come in during that talk. And again, thanks so much for joining in this morning or um, early afternoon. Um, so one of the questions was, does Isuvis have the potential to standardize how we use steroids in dry eye disease? Now, this is an interesting question for sure. If you think about what we have as our guidelines, you know, with um, TFOS DUES 2 and even pre-surgical guidelines now with the ASCRS guidelines, these management algorithms are constructed, you know, and help us recommend the sequence of treatments that are going to best help our patients um, with dry eye disease, depending on the stage of their disease. If you take TFOS DUES 2, for example, and you look at their stage treatment, you know, usually step one would include things that are non-prescriptive items, um, artificial lubricants. Um, maybe moisture goggles, things along those lines. But as soon as you get to step two th therapies, we're looking to things like corticosteroids. So having something that is, you know, ISUVIS, which is FDA approved um, for this short-term relief of, of um, signs and symptoms of dry eye disease, I think is going to definitely help us with this standardization that we're seeking so much. Anytime we can get an FDA approval, for something that we're treating, whether it's acute or chronic, it really helps us as um, the clinician have confidence in what we're prescribing. So I hope so. I mean, that's one of the challenges with dry eye is that it is, you know, it is hard to standardize. So it would be exciting to have more standard approaches for sure. Another question is, what type of patient are you most excited to use Isuvis in? And for me, this one, you know, is actually easy to answer. I have a few patients in mind already that are kind of on a waiting list for when I have the opportunity to have product in hand. Um, and one of those are my new starts, right? So a patient that I'm newly diagnosing with dry eye is somebody that I, I'm going to be thinking of this as a first line therapy. But the ones that I have kind of in limbo waiting are my patients with chronic disease that I already know have been having flares, whether it's seasonal flares or something related to their work environment. Um, and so I have a handful of those patients that I'm really excited to be able, again, to prescribe something FDA approved you know, in particular for that flare of their symptoms. Another question was about, are, uh, am I concerned about IOP increase with ISUVIS? Again, remember back to some of the slides in the presentation. This is one of the large, this is actually the largest study to date of dry eye patients. And the safety profile was really quite good with only 0.2% of those in the study receiving ISUVIS having a, a pressure increase of concern. So, you know, I'm going to prescribe this with a low concern for, you know, an eye pressure increase. And finally, when will ISUVIS be available, which is something that I have my countdown clock on for as well. I'm really, again, excited to have this in my toolbox for treating my dry eye patients. And it looks like early January 2021 is when we can expect product um, to be available for us and our patients. 
So I just wanted to thank you again for taking time you know, to join in. And I would take this time to head over to the exhibit halls. We have a lot of great um, exhibitors there and you know, lots to learn from them. So be sure to spend some time in the exhibit booths and I'll see you next time.